worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you. I praise you. I bless your name, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Jesus, praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Blessing and honor to you, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Praise your name. Bless you, Lord. I love you. Hallelujah. I don't know uh, who you are, but there are people, I don't even know how many, you're thinking, man, I wish we had this back home. Well, you know you can. I mean, it isn't like God has esteemed us above everybody else. See, I, I know it's really great to have singers and musicians and so forth. I understand that. But you can have the presence of God away from this room and away from these singers and away from the musicians. You really can. Now, it might feel more difficult. But really, I guess you could say there are a couple of aspects of worship, and one is what's going on here, and the other is when you're away from here. See, God said He didn't have it our praises, but He didn't say it was dependent upon being in a congregational setting with singers and musicians. And in a way, we kind of have to get past the flesh and the mindset of, well, if I'm not there, it won't be the same. Well, you're right in that it won't be the same number of voices and it won't be the same musicians, but God will still be the same. He'll still be the same. And look, there are some churches, they flat out are not going to go for what's happening in this conference. And I'm talking about the praise and worship. They just won't. And it's not that they're not saved, but, you know, until you understand this, capture a glimpse of it, and want it, it's not going to happen. So from that aspect, yeah, you know, you might not have it, the same in your church but you can have it the same in your life you definitely can so I want to encourage you don't let the emotions and the thoughts of boy if only I could be back there in that church well we'd love to have you <laughs> but when it comes to you and that time with Jesus He'll show up. He'll show up in your bathroom. He'll show up just when you start worshiping Him. And, you know, Jesus, you know, all those musicians and those other singers aren't here. It's just you and me. But I'm going to worship you anyway because I love you and I want to. And He says, that is all it takes. I am there. And change will come. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, why don't you get around and greet some people and just let somebody know that they're loved. Wasn't that pizza good? Oh. Mm -mm -mm. See, now I know why you guys keep coming back to these conferences. You want pizza? And then after the pizza, it's like everybody invaded graders. <laughs> yeah. Man, it was great. Great at graders. Hallelujah.
Praise God. I'm enjoying this conference. I'm enjoying it a lot. And I'm, not, I'm not just saying that because, you know, well, you're the pastor. You got to. No, I'm serious. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, you know, the, the teaching has just been phenomenal. You know, <laughs> we had somebody leave our church one time. They were upset with me. They said, uh, I know, I know. How? <laughs> they were upset with me because, and they said uh, the reason was because I teach too many series. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you know, when you dig into a subject, it, it can take longer than one or two sermons. And even then, you don't exhaust the subject. It, it's impossible to, I don't care what, pick the subject. It's impossible to exhaust it in one series. I don't care how long you teach. Um, and, you know, the thing, the whole line upon line, precept upon precept, that requires more than just a sermon or two. But, you know, some folks, when they're raised in an atmosphere of, uh, you know, high-powered screaming, shouting, and, and all that kind of stuff, well, they're trained to look for that. And, you know, they love God. That's not the question. But, you know, that's just been ingrained in them. And, okay, well, praise God. You know, you're going you're gonna to make it to heaven, and you love the Lord. And, buddy, you're steadfast in your, your walk, and that you're not going back into sin. But there's a lot more. And personally, I mean, I want a lot more. I really do. Now, hey, look, I enjoy a good scream and shouting sermon every now and then. I really do. And I, personally, I think every now and then it's good to have one of those. You know, it just kind of stirs you up a little bit. And, uh, but anyway, praise God. Um, I'll share this with you. It's kind of relative to what we've been hearing this week. And, uh, you, know, you know, we can't just be hearers of the word. We've got to be doers. We're here some time back, and I'm telling all myself here, and that's okay because some of you might be able to relate to it, but some time back, and I wrote it down, it's in my notes, it'll probably stay there forever. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, you're surfing. And what he meant was, out of everything I've experienced with him, you know what a surfer does? A surfer gets on the surfboard, and you know they just ride the waves, right? But they never get in, and they never go deeper. And it was like he was impressing upon me. You're riding the waves of the revelation you've received to this point, but you're not going deeper into what you received. It's like, okay. Now, you think, well, you know, why in the world would you say that? I mean, we liked you before. <laughs> well, that's because I think a lot of us can relate to that. So, you know, I'm, I'm still working on that to... Uh, get away from that surfing aspect. And this week has encouraged me along those lines. Uh, I don't want to become complacent. I don't want to become, you know, just comfortable. I want to be stirred. And, and I want to be convicted. Because I need to go deeper, and I need to become that reflection of the image of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So I, I'm really enjoying these messages. I'm really blessed. I'm going to exhort you briefly here on the offering. And I'm going to share something with you that here just a few weeks ago, it hit me so hard, something that I saw in the Word, and I'm going to share it with you. And uh, I, you know, I, said, I looked at this and I thought, holy cow. Well, maybe we shouldn't say that in church. You know, holy Jesus. I, mean, I don't know. Just, oh my goodness. Look at this. Look at this. And maybe you've seen it before. And, and when I, once I point it out, you'll think, okay, you know, big whoop. But for me, this was amazing. And I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 23. Now, in Luke chapter 23, what's happened is Jesus, he's been arrested. He's been put on trial, and now he has been nailed to the cross. And so there he is on the cross, and we pick it up 
in verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. So what do we have? We have, you know, what's interesting is that um, it's like in all the movies you see of Jesus, you know, carrying his cross and, you know, going to Golgotha to be crucified and so forth. Well, there were two other people there with him carrying their own crosses. They were being taken with him at the time. So the, if the movies don't show those other two, the movies are wrong. <laughs> but it says here that uh, these other criminals were led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then if you jump down here to verse 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, in other words, you know, making fun of him and, you know, just, just being cruel. He said, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And we've heard this story so many times. And, uh, you know, I was looking at this and, and I got to thinking, okay, <laughs> These three people, the two criminals and Jesus, they've been crucified. They are hanging on the cross. There are three crosses, Jesus in the middle, you know, one criminal to the left, one criminal to the right. They're on the cross. Now, we've all heard stories about, you know, what it means to be crucified. You know, you have the nails driven in, in, your, in the hands and the feet and so forth. And with Jesus, they had even put that crown of thorns on him. And this was before they put the spear in his side. But before Jesus was crucified, we know what happened. Remember, it talks about how he was beaten, how he, you know, they plucked the, the beard from his face. And uh, he is, in fact, if you go to, uh, we won't turn to it, but in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, it, it kind of describes how Jesus was so mutilated. You know, we hid, as, our, as it were, our eyes from him. I mean, he was just, he was a mess. You know, it said his visage was marred beyond anybody else. He, he was so mutilated, so tortured. Uh, if you looked at him, he would just be a bloody mess. It was horrible, absolutely horrible horrible what had happened to him. His back was ripped open. I mean, on and on. They had beaten him. And here's the point I'm trying to make. Jesus is on that cross after that horrific beating. And what's about to happen? He's going to die, right? See, when they put you on the cross, they didn't put you there to teach you a lesson. They put you there to kill you. And to teach other people a lesson. You see this? Okay, you act up. We put you up there. You die. And you will die a horrible, horrible death. And so there's Jesus. He's on the cross. Now he's just a short time away from dying. And these other thieves, you know, the, the, they know they're going to die too. And the one, you know, he's just being a smart aleck. But the other says... Hey, look, don't you have any... Now, look what he says here. He says, in verse 40, you know, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Okay, now, what do we see here? We see that this guy has some kind of understanding and concept of God. And he knows he's going to die. But he also knows Jesus is going to die. He knows it's coming. Any moment, they're going to die. That's it. Die. But look what he says. Verse 40. Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Do you realize what this man is saying? He's saying, Jesus, <laughs> you're going to die. 
like we're going to die. But somehow, and I don't know how and I don't understand it, but you're not going to stay dead. You are going to raise from the dead and you are going to have a kingdom that is an eternal kingdom. And all I ask is that when you are raised from the dead and you come into your kingdom, would you please remember me? Hanging on that cross moments away from death, somehow this guy got a revelation. He's going to die, but he's not going to stay dead. I may stay dead, but he's not going to stay dead. However, if he remembers me when he comes into his kingdom, maybe I won't stay dead either. Think about what this guy is saying. Somehow, some way, he captured a revelation. Jesus Christ is going to live. He's going to rise from the dead. And he's going to have a kingdom that's going to last. And he just might remember me. I don't know how in the world he came to that realization. I don't know how he captured that understanding, but he did. And as I was looking at this and, and thinking about this and meditating, it was like the Lord spoke to me and he said, that guy captured the revelation that Jesus was going to die, but he was going to rise again. Have you captured the revelation that I'm your provider? And I thought, glory to God. If I have captured the revelation that he's my provider, I'm not going to worry about how much money I put in an offering plate. I'm not going to worry if I've, if I've, you know, have I been a good boy today? You know, have I, have I said enough, you know, praise you, Jesus, that he'll help me out today? See, if we, if we capture the vision, the concept that God is our provider, we will not worry about the most dire of situations. This guy was in the worst situation imaginable. He's dying, and he knows it. On the surface, on the outside, there's no hope. There's no chance. That's it, dude. You're done for. Your life is over. But he had somehow reconciled in himself. If Jesus lives... Maybe I can live too. And he's going to rise from the dead. You know what? I'm guessing. <laughs> I, I'm guess, I don't know. But I would like to think, hey, I'm going to be with him today in paradise. God, let me hurry up and die. L let me die now. Let's get it over. Death isn't going to be that bad when I know who's waiting for me on the other side. Have we captured the vision that God is our provider? Has it made that much of an impact on us the way this guy saw Jesus and the impact it made on him? I can honestly tell you, I don't think I'm there yet. Oh, I know he's my provider, I understand that. But at this level of revelation to where at the, at the worst of the worst, the most challenging situation that I could ever face, I can still say, hey, he's my provider. Because quite frankly, I've never been in the worst of the worst of the worst. You know what I'm talking about? In a financial situation, I've never been there. And I would like to think that when I, not when, no, <laughs> no, strike when. If, if I was ever in a situation like that, I would like to think, hey, Jesus, you know, you're still my provider. <laughs> you're still my provider. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know the way. But you are my provider. And I'm trusting in you. When we get to that point, listen, when we get to that point, it doesn't matter what we're lacking. We will have no worry. We will have no fear. We will not get all worked up over a lack of money. It doesn't mean that, that we ignore responsibility. It just means, you know what? I have the peace that passes all understanding, and, and I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you, Father. I'm trusting you to help me through this. And see, in this room tonight and people watching, I have no doubt but what there are people here and watching who are facing financial challenges. I want to encourage you tonight 
that no matter what you're facing, God is your provider. He is your provider. Some way, somehow, He will help. Keep trusting Him. Keep trusting Him. You know, this thief that was on the cross, once he got that word from Jesus, you're going to be with me in paradise, that's what he held on to to his very last breath. We have a word from God. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that's just one of many. God is able to make all grace abound unto you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. On and on it goes. Praise God. I want to capture this revelation of God being my provider in such a way it will never be shaken, ever, no matter what. God can't lie. He is my foundation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, if you have uh, uh, an offering tonight, the offering envelopes are there in the pews. And uh, any checks, just make them out to GCC. Those of you watching, whatever the Lord has spoken to you to give or what you'd purpose in your heart, you you can give through PayPal or you can mail an offering in. And we thank you for helping us out here with the conference, the expenses and so forth. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, I'm glad I'm born again. I'm glad I'm born again. I'm glad I have a risen Savior. I'm glad I have a Father who loves me. I'm glad there's somebody I can depend on 24 hours a day who never sleeps and never slumbers and never going to be bothered if I wake up in the middle of the night and give him a call. (laughs) He won't put his phone on silent. (laughs) He leaves the ringer on. Hallelujah. All right, everybody go ahead and stand. Ushers, please come forward. Praise God. Father, thank you so much for being a good, good father and for being a good, good provider. May we capture the fullness of every revelation of you and who you are the way that we should to the same depth that that thief on the cross captured of Jesus. Thank you for being our provider, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Thank you guys so much. And uh, as many of you know, Gary Carpenter's mother's sister passed away. And so Gary and uh, his daughter Angie and her husband Kevin had to leave. They're, dry, they're on the road right now, headed back to Tulsa to uh, get his mother. His mother's like 97, and the sister who passed away was 87. And his mother is the oldest, well, the, old, the only remaining member of the family on, you know, on that side. And so Gary's going back to be there, and, and rightfully so. Um, so praise God for you know, the safety of their trip back home. But right now, uh, we are going to be blessed. Uh, I was going to say, you know, we're gonna, our socks are going to be blessed off or something. <laughs> anyway, Pastor Bronk Flint is going to come up now and share the word of God. guys are so gracious. I love you so much. I'll tell you what, I'm really having a wonderful time this week. Uh, uh, Pastor Jim said Gary and, and uh, Kevin and Angie left this afternoon. We were able to say goodbye because they were right close to us across the hall and help them with their stuff down to the car. They may be watching tonight. I know they were going to try based on where they, wherever they were at, but hallelujah. You guys are such a gracious crowd, and uh, I, I've really enjoyed and I'm enjoying. I'm just a little bit sad that it's going to be over in a couple of days, um, but it's not. We're just going to extend it. We're just going to take, a, as Pastor Jim says, a like a 11 and a half month uh, sabbatical or leave for a little bit. You know? <laughs> so hallelujah. Um, bless the Lord. Has everybody recovered from Marion today? 
So, hallelujah. Um, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I just want to welcome everyone that's watching, all the, the friends and family and maybe some Amakaleans. Um, that's great, but my only question to you is, why are you not at church? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is an honor. I tell you, it really is an honor. I, I appreciate uh, Pastor Jim having the confidence in, in uh, Christ in me to be able to minister to you. And um, it always is an incredible honor. This morning, uh, when, when Jim was describing, uh, started out of Habakkuk 3 and, and began to launch out of there from the baptism of Jesus. And when he explained and, and I saw that explanation or that, that vision, I, I thought I was going I, I to come out of my seat. Hallelujah. How good was that? It just, my God, it was so good. And then last night, how good was last night? I, I know that I told Gary today, this morning, I said, my Lord, brother, you were throwing 100 mile an hour fastballs. That, I'm telling you, that was unbelievable. I said, you know, I told him after service, you're good, but you're not that good. I mean, you're, you're, you, and he goes, I know, I know, I know. I said, man. But both of these guys really, to me, are teachers, teachers, teachers. They really are. Pastor Jim and Gary and, um, you know, I understand nowadays, um, and I and I can't I can't hardly believe it, but I, I understand it's true. You know that you can buy uh, you can buy sermons online. Yeah. They, you can, and uh, preachers do that. And I think that is one of the stupidest <laughs> things possible. Why would I buy a sermon online when I can go and get Jim's sermons for free, <laughs> or or Gary's sermons for free? I mean, that is so. Why would you buy it when you can just get it? Just, that's a no-brainer. That's, my God, it's just crazy what people will do. So, <laughs> hallelujah. So, man, I guess we'll learn. Hallelujah. Would you say this with me? Because something is already here, something is coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Do you believe that? I believe that. I be, because it's already here, we're going we're gonna to see this brought into fruition. Would you just uh, pray with me right now? Let me just pause, listen, and receive. Father, I just worship you. Bless you. So thankful for this crowd and for those that are watching tonight and those that will be watching in the days ahead through the archives or through the YouTube channel. Father, we thank you because we are part of every, we're part of destiny and it's not because we are something of ourselves, but all oh, the graciousness of God. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm going to minister uh, a message tonight that I've recently, and this, it, it's not warmed over stew, it's just part of my heart right now, and um, it's called Beyond Bosom, and I want you to turn with me to start with to Exodus chapter 3, I've got, hallelujah, hallelujah. glory be to God. What, I, what we're going to look at tonight is, I want to tell you to start with, that without um, this happening to us personally and without this happening, what we're going to talk about, what the Lord's going to go through with us corporately, what we're after, it, it won't happen. Um, it won't come into fullness. But I am, I am in full belief that in the pursuit of where we're at, we're going to see these things come to pass. I thought Pastor Jim was going to was going to preach part of the uh, was going to preach the entirety of of this message when he was just exhorting on on worship and private worship and what that brings into your life. 
because that, that's part of, of tonight's message. Without what we're going to see tonight coming into um, our life and fruition in, in, a, in a strong place, um, this won't happen. But as I said, I, I know that this, this being the move that we're believing God for, the fullness of the reality of the kingdom restored, it's going to happen. Um, Gary said last night, and, and I don't want to oversimplify, it was just incredible um, that even with the Holy Ghost, even with praying in tongues, even with the power of the word, um, that, we, that we would still have the possibility exist of deception without doing the word. And that was, uh, that was a big, that was the major part, that you could deceive yourself having heard the word, having said under the word, and even praying in tongues, but if you came to a point and you weren't, you would never graduate to actually doing the word, um, this, the scripture says we become a deceiver of ourselves. Amen? Yeah. So we can, we, can, we can spend the night in a garage, but that doesn't make us a car. Right? You can go to uh, Grace Christian and hear just sermon after sermon, line upon line, precept, but just because you go, or just because, or wherever you're at, and this speaks for all of us, we can hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, but unless it is applied on a continual basis and we do the next step. So um, we're going we're gonna to launch out of Exodus chapter 3 and just kind of use this as just a, as a, a touch point of where we're headed tonight. Verse 1 says, And now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. And then God goes on to give him instruction. But the key thing that I wanted us to see here tonight, just in this, is that Moses saw, and Moses saw the burning bush, and when he turned, the Bible says, when he turned aside, right. when there was something inside of him that says, I've got to see what it, what, what, why does this bush, what, why is it not being consumed? There was a hunger to know, but not only was there a hunger, I mean, anybody seeing a bush that's not con consumed, um, that would be very curious, but the Bible distinctly says when he turned aside, when he, when he began to, to, to investigate, when he began to look at it, then the Lord began to speak to him. You're here tonight, you're listening tonight because something is inside of you and there's a divine compass that is that the Holy Spirit, see, this is why... Uh, there, there's not a difference, but there is a difference. There's not a difference in that you've got, and I've got, or anybody listening has got a better born-again spirit than any of our friends that don't get this, okay? It's just like the Holy Ghost. Uh, once you get the Holy Ghost, as Gary was bringing out, you don't get part of the Holy Ghost. You get the full, you get the full measure. You get the fullness. So whether you're born again not spirit-filled or born again and spirit-filled, you get everything. So it's not, but what distinguishes us is that whether or not we will stop and turn aside, whether or not there's something inside of us that says, it's not okay for me to stay where, I've, where I'm at. And, you know, I've, through the years, and you've done the same thing, I'm sure you've, you've, uh, You've shared this message uh, or, or shared the acclamation of what we understand as 
the message, and I'm not trying to epitomize that as something that's the top shelf. It's the Word of God that what we're sharing. Or you've given Dave's book out to one of your members of your family or whatever, and it's just like it just went right over their head. It just didn't stick. It was like, yeah, thank you very much. You could have gave him a newspaper and it would have made the same difference. Yeah. But the, the thing of it is, is once, and this is, it, this, is a, this is the mystery because it's really part of your own volition. It's part of your own will, whether or not you'll turn aside and say, I want to see why, what's in the bush. And so we're turning aside when we come to Dayton and we're saying, Lord, what is it that you're trying to get across to this generation what is it that, and as Jim was saying a few moments ago, even if, it, even if it has a momentary owie to it at times, an ouch to the part of our flesh, then Lord, please, Lord, don't abate. Don't, don't hold off. Give us everything that, that we need to have. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So I almost called this message, I almost called it the 70, the 12, the 3, and the 1. That's what I almost named it. But I didn't. It's, uh, you'll understand in just a, a few moments. Uh, let's look at, I want us to, uh, we're going to look at in just a few moments, um, the 82 disciples of the Lord um, that, that followed him. Um, and we're going to examine beyond that the 12. Uh, we're going to go from the 70 to the 12. Um, I want us to look, let's just kind of ease into this um, real ginger-like, and then we'll kind of as the Lord leads steamroll towards the end. Uh, let's go to, to John chapter 1. We'll just talk about, this is real simple. Um, just talk about the call of the disciples for just a moment. How wonderful that was. Um, just real, this is real simple. This is not any wowie of revelation. Verse 34, and I saw and bear record this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, I'm looking at verse 36, if I didn't say that. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, now this was John, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek you, or what seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. And, came, and they came and saw where he dwelt, and behold, uh, and, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus behold, uh, beheld him, he saith, And thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpreted a stone. And then he goes on to, to talk about the following day that Jesus went into Galilee and found Philip, and he continues to build this core of disciples. Um, we're going to talk about the disciples for just a little bit because that's important towards the end of this message. And, and where we're going because we're going to have some kind of, I hope, identification in your heart of where you want to be. And I can conclude already where, where, you're, where you'll want to be. But uh, as an investigation in all of our hearts, an identification with, with these men. Um, simple, real simple. Um, John and, and, and Andrew, um, these guys were already... Um, John doesn't identify himself. He's kind of talking um, uh, second person here, but he's, he's already a spiritual, if you want to call him, not born again, but already a spiritual man in the sense that he's looking, he's, he's investigating the burning bush because he's a, a disciple of John the Baptist. So he's hearing John the Baptist and we see, and thank God for John's gospel. I love John's gospel. I love the coincidence of all the gospels, but you get something out of John's that you don't normally get from some of the others because um, when you look at some of the others, and true to form, I mean, it does say this, but you get an idea that um, 
that Jesus just walked by one day, and, and it does say this, as I said, that he just walked by the shore and just called the people in boats, these men in boats, to two separate brothers, and said, follow me, and they just, you know, just without knowledge, just jumped ship and said, you know, we'll follow you. Um, but <laughs> when, you, you, when you find, uh, when you follow John here, and, and you follow the sequential order of things, and you kind of put in, into perspective, John gives us an aspect here, is that really the first time that Jesus ever met John and Andrew was when Jesus is walking, and he walks you know, down through along the, sh the shore of the Jordan, and they're already you know, uh, engaged with what John's ministry and John introduces them. That's the introduction. John introduces them to Jesus, and he does it by way of saying, this is, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, they begin to, as what we just read, they begin to follow him, and as they follow him, uh, he, he knows that they're following. He turns around, and now I'm putting it in my vernacular. He says, you know, why are you following uh, very graciously? Well, um, it's, it's like they're stumped. You know, it's like... Uh, uh, they don't have any theological questions like, where do you live? And he goes, well, why don't you come and see? And so uh, that's, the, that's from John's perspective, and that really, uh, if, if you look at it and, and you study and as you read and you try to synchronize the, the way that these disciples were brought into, into his discipleship, it also makes more sense because you understand that as these guys were introduced, what, what do you think when he brought them into his house that day or wherever he dwelt and he sat down with them, um, what, do you, what do you think that he began to say? I know that he began to share with them his vision, where he was going, and aspects of the kingdom of God. The Bible says here that then, then as a result, you know, Andrew goes the next day and says, look, we found the Messiah. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, well, you know, they had, they had had this long teaching that they had gotten from somebody, and, and I didn't even try to, you know, re rebuttal. They, they were saying, yeah, they just jumped out of the ship that day because um, he, had, he was a rabbi, and he wore a rabbi's coat, and the rabbi's coat just, just mesmerized them, and they just listened. I, you know, I, I, I liked, you know, Jim was talking about the humanity of Christ uh, this morning. Listen, if... As Jesus is walking along that shore in his humanity, um, there, there's nothing. Here's the deal. If somebody walked by your office and said, follow me, would you just, would you just say, hey, look, I'm, I'm quitting my job today. I'm, I, that's it. I'm quitting. I'm, I'm leaving. They had had an introduction. Even Matthew, I, I can't prove it by scripture, but even Matthew, when he walks by the receipt of customs and says, follow me, they're probably probably was behind the scenes, maybe days, weeks, where he began to glean these guys and begin to customize them to, to what he was planning on doing. And I'm saying all that to say we're, we get an understanding of how these disciples were put together and how they were brought together. I want us to look at uh, just their ordination for just a moment. Let's, let's go to, uh, to Mark chapter 3. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Yes. Glory. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 3, let's look at verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And of course, each one of the Gospels um, have their own rendition of this. In verse 14, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. To have power to heal the sick, to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Boadjernus, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus the son of the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed betrayed him, and they went into a house. So we see here 
um, their, their call, their ordination here as far as Jesus calling them and bringing them forth into his ministry. Now let's look at, uh, just for a moment, um, I, I said from the beginning, the 82 disciples of the Lord, and some of you might have thought, wow, he's, you know, he's went squirrely on us. There was only 12. But let's just look at the other 70. And the only place that that is mentioned really is in Luke's gospel, and that's chapter 10. So go with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 10. And let's see. Chapter 9 of Luke's gospel is, is uh, Jesus dealing and calling, uh, also a rendition of Jesus calling the 12. But here we see the only place really that the 70 are mentioned of the four gospels. And we'll read down. Let's just read. I'll, you, I'll read. You follow um, for a number of verses here. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and, and two before his face into every city and place whether himself should come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be unto this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. And if not, it shall return to you again. And in the same manner remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house and into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. If we were to go to the chapter before, which we won't take because of time's sake, he pretty much said these same things unto the twelve. So what you see, really, there's a... It's, it's almost a duplication of instruction and what's going to happen um, he gives also to the 70. And heal the sick that are therein and say unto them that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out of the city or the, uh, go your way out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works of, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they would have a great while repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable. Toler, <laughs> yeah, toleration. Okay. For Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, thou shalt be thrust to hell, uh, down to hell. Now let me jump um, down into the, where I really wanted to go. That's enough on that. Jesus given instruction. Um, let's go a little bit further in the chapter. Uh, well, I thought I had it here. When they return, okay, and the 70, verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, Behold, I beheld Satan as lightning fallen from the heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Hallelujah. So what he's saying there is this. Um, we, what we're just reading here is that there, that there was an ordination for the 12. We didn't look at that per se. We, we saw the calling. But then there was the 70. And then he sends out the 70. Well, he gives them the same, the rights and power. But as they come back, what we see here is this, that, that they, were, they were mesmerized or they were astonished at the power that even the devils were subject to them. And that's wonderful, but Jesus corrects them and says, look, don't let your astonishment, don't let uh, the, the, the values of the kingdom be in, in power, what you've seen, but that your names are written down in the book of life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so what we see from that, just in, in that sense of the word, if we, if we fast forward, is that 
even today if we put it in the perspective and i know these men were not yet born again but if we transition into the church now we can see this that there is even if if the church if there's a group that does turn aside and does want to know what's in the burning bush then they're so oftentimes mesmerized by the power that that's all that they're that's all they think about that's all that they're and, and that's that's where we're at this week we want, we want to see the revival we want, we, because we believe that that kingdom is already here. But our aspects are not to look at the power and get focused on the power. It's to be focused on Christ and the word. And from that, let the power come from us. That we're not part of the 70 that says, okay, Lord, this is our attention. Our attention is not on the power. Our attention is on Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, so... Let's turn to, uh, to John chapter, chapter 6. Because uh, we'll, we'll look at something here just for a moment real quick. John chapter 6. So we're still talking about the disciples. And we'll look at, um, in particular, it doesn't say it here, but it has to be part of the 70. Let's look way down, looking at my notes. I want to make sure I get here to the right scripture. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, uh, let's see, verse 53. then Jesus uh, said unto, uh, hold on, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh, or for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth, or dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. And he that eateth this bread shall, shall live forever. These things he spoke in the synagogue, and many of therefore of, look at verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when he had heard this, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can bear it? And when Jesus knew it in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now let's just skip on down just a little bit. And it says here in 64, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who would betray him. Therefore, he said that no man can come to the father except it were given to me or given unto him of my father. From that time, now this is the verse I wanted, but from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus, uh, then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? And then Simon answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So what it's identifying here is this, that even though the 70 were sent, uh, it says, it doesn't say 70 here, but it says that many of his disciples, when they heard his word, walked no, no longer with him. Uh, what Jesus was doing was teaching here, and at some point, even though that there were 70 more, they were in the outer sphere of influence as far as how close they were to jesus but jesus had ordained them of of essence and said i'm giving you the same power that i'm giving the 12 but when he came to a certain point uh you you can say it like this the doctrine that he was teaching was too much for them and he said many of his disciples walk now i know you could put it in a big sense that you could say well he may have had a lot of followers as in quote disciples but if you look at it really in the essence here, these were, these were a closer knit group and many of those departed from him. See, here's the message here in simplicity, doctrine, even among disciples that are part of his disciples will sever people from the group. It'll cut away the group. And what we're seeing in this day is that doctrine separates. And even there was the 70, and the 70 followed him, and the 70 believed, 
but then it came to a point where what was being taught could no longer be tolerated. And so that's what we're seeing in the body of Christ even now is that what, what is being taught as of truth, many are going away and say, we, we, can't, we can't stomach that anymore. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So we're going somewhere with this, so just hang with me just for a little bit here. Now, let's, let me just kind of speed this up. I won't go into all, all the different scriptures because I really want to capitalize on some of the, the end scriptures here. Let's just talk about the 12 for just a moment, and I'll just read this scripture to you. We won't, we won't turn there. We all know this, that the 12 followed him um, throughout the three and a half years, right? We understand that, what, three, three and a half years, that the 12 were followers of Christ. Beyond the, the perimeter of the 70, they followed him, and they laid down their life as far as their agendas, they left home, they left marriages, they followed Christ. But at some point in Mark 10, 28, uh, Peter said this, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all to follow thee. And then he goes on to the, he gives the question like, basically, what do we get out of this? So the 70 at some point, there was part of them that left. I don't know how many. But even the 12 that were following him extensively, um, there were times where they themselves, like P Peter asked the question, uh, we, we've left all to follow you. What do we get out of it? And it seems to be by that question, without us going into scripture here because of the sake of time, it seems to be that, that Peter was actually speaking as a spokesman for these guys. And so whether or not they put him up to it, I don't know. But it was like, we're following you. We've, we haven't left you. Like Peter said, you know, yes, they're leaving. They're going bye-bye. But, but we're not going anyplace. We're going to stick with you because you're, you're, you've got the words of life. But at some point later, even though they were sticking with him, he still wanted to know, what do we get out of it? What do, you know, the, the caucus here, what's emanating from everybody's mind is, We've been following you. We weren't the ones that left, but what do we get out of it? So even the 12 wanted to, to, to know. Let's just talk just for a moment about the three. The three being um, an inner circle that we see uh, numerous times throughout the, the four Gospels. Um, and that was, that was Peter and James and John. And we see distinctly without not trying to make a doctrine out of it, but we see, I wrote down some scriptures here. You can just write them down if you like or just listen to it later um, and get the scriptures out. Matthew 17, 1 through 4, that was the time where Jesus went up to the mount and he was transfigured and he took those three disciples with him. He pulled out of the, the 12, three that followed him. Now, I, I don't know... I, I don't know why, especially, uh, you know, it, that, he, that he selected these. He must have seen something in them uh, that, he was, that he believed that he could pass on, that even though the 12 were following him and he knew that one was going to betray him, he knew that he had at least 11 true followers, but out of that he selected um, three. And I, I can't believe that he just, by his own... Uh, that it was like a sovereign, I like you, eeny, meeny, mighty, mo. I'm, I'm going to, you know, Peter, you're a little better looking, and John, you're a little, you know, you're a little more fit than the rest of them, you know, and, and James, I, I just like the name James, and so I'm just going to pick you three. There must have been something about them, and, and I don't have scripture and verse on it, but it's just knowing the character of Christ that there was a, a selection so they follow him up. They spend the whole night there. They see this vision. We're not going to go into the vision. Incredible vision with Moses and Elijah. Um, and, and in that vision, um, Peter, uh, of course, I, I know he's not born again, and, and we'll give him the credit for that. But still we see, we see an illustration here that bears repeating that Peter misinterpreted the whole, the whole thing. He's there by Christ's invitation to, be, to see something and to behold something, and later he talks about it in, 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 in his epistle, 
but he's there to be taught. He's there to, to see something. And he misinterprets the whole moment and says, you know, during the midst of it, Lord, uh, it's really, this is really neat. Can, can we build three tabernacles here and, and honor you and Moses and Elijah? And, and then the Holy Spirit, of, you know, overshadows him. The father says, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. And, you know, you know the story. But the illustration and the reason why I bring that up is that he brought them with him. That was that selection. The other selection is, or the other illustration of these three is in Luke chapter 8, 50 through 55. And this was when, um, of course, Jairus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, comes, pleads with him and says, you know, come to my house. When he gets there, he forbades everybody else, including disciples, except the mother, the father, and these three disciples. Come in with me. Come in with me. Again, he's... There's something there that in their life, um, not, by, not by what we would call um, brownie points, but something that he saw in them that, 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 that pulled them to a place of, uh, and it, it, it'd be a misnomer to say status quo, but it brought them into a place where they were invited to come in to an inner circle. And, and, and that's, that's really neat. The other one is in Mark. There may be more, I don't, I don't know. I didn't sit and think so much or go through all the scripture. Mark 14, that's the end of his life, and that's the garden. And again, we see the illustration of uh, the, you know, the nine being left out. Of course, Judas was gone. So the, the, there would be the, the eight, but the three he brings to the garden of Gethsemane, or the, the whole bunch he brings to the garden of Gethsemane, and then to the three he says, come a little closer. Come come a little bit closer and each time when you read in the gospels he doesn't go back to the the group he goes back to the intermediate three and speaks to peter and says why could you not tarry with me though the reason why i say that is because again illustration after illustration is that there was three among the 12 that at least had something going on inside of them that he recognized that gravitated them to him to where that he could impart to them he could give to them, and he knew that they would carry on past, and, and even, even all of his disciples uh, were going to, as we read history, uh, go on to be incredible men and passed on the, 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 the gospel. But these three had a key point to, to play. So everybody's still with me? Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's turn to John chapter 13. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say hallelujah or Honolulu or something. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> so you know this is the what we would commonly uh, refer to as the Last Supper. This is just before his crucifixion. And let's see. I think we'll begin in, uh, in verse 21. Hallelujah. And when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the, disciple, then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. I love the way John refers to himself. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying. I'm not saying anything, but <laughs> the disciple that he loved, you know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. That's what I meant, yeah. I'm just saying. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom the one, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, and the word beckoned here, um, it just simply means to, to, it just simply means to nod or gesture, make a gesture to him that he should ask who it was or who should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop. 
when I have dipped. And then, of course, when he gave the sop to Judas, John understood. Now, I want us to do just a, a moment of word study here, and then I want to talk about the con uh, contextually what I want you hopefully to see, because we, we've discussed at this point the, the 70 disciples that followed him but were enthralled in power. They, they, they enjoyed seeing the power, but they did not understand his heart. They did not have the kind of relationship, so much so that when it came to doctrine, when something offended them, they, they went amiss. Then we've discussed uh, to this point the 12 that followed him, but still had an attitude at times, what do we get out of this? They'd never... And then the three, of course, they, there was an inner circle, if you want to say it that way, but still uh, they could at times have um, a character to misinterpret what was trying to be, be given to them. We just read this scripture here, and we'll, I'll read part of it again in just a moment. Um, actually, let me read just a little bit again and then stop at a, at, at a few words. In verse 21 again, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask whom it should be to whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus', Jesus breast, saying to him, Lord, who is it? Now, I just, I did a word study recently, and this is not my forte, but uh, of course, I mean, I can read and I can and meditate, and, and this is pretty easy. I mean, I, 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 I sat under some Greek teachers in Bible college. Uh, I didn't learn a whole lot, but I, I sat under them. But here's, let's just look just for a moment at some of these words and I think it'll mean something even more greater to you in just a moment. Um, I looked at through, through, the, through the Strong's Concordance and all through, also through an expanded Greek dictionary and also through an um, interlineal, which gives you the transliteration of actually what it's saying here. And the Bible says here that John was leaning. It doesn't, doesn't identify him by name, by name. The word leaning means this uh it's akamia and it means to recline now you're not going to get any whoo out of that but when he says here that he was leaning in verse 23 he was leaning it just simply means to recline or to lean back the word bosom the word bosom because what we're looking at here is something that we can see contextually and something also by word definition. The word bosom here is culpus. And that word, by definition, bosom, means uh, a bay or an opening. Uh, the expanded Greek in this meant the front part of the body between the arms. Okay? See this? this these are my armpits. And I did shower and I did put deodorant on today. But the, but the in-between part is the bay or the opening. It's the expansion between the, the arms. And that is the word bosom. Uh, the word bosom, um, by what we're about to say in just a moment, I will tell you this. Um, it can mean the closest possible place to an individual. Um, John 1.18 says, no man, this is speaking of Jesus, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So when we talk about Jesus being in the bosom of the Father, how many of you know you can't get any closer than Jesus was to the Father? So what I'm saying is bosom is a wonderful place of intimacy. The word lying here in verse 25, uh, epipito, it means this. That's a close pronunciation, but not, not exact, maybe. It means to embrace. It means to embrace or seize with more or less violence. It means to 
sees with us an extreme sense of closeness. Verse 25, breast, Stath, stathos, it means this, the entire, not just the opening, but it means it's the entire bosom and it identifies it, i.e. chest, the actual chest, okay? John went, as we read this, let's just kind of, let me just kind of read the, a couple of these verses. 23 says, and there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, or there was, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And we understand that to be John, of course. Simon, P Simon Peter therefore beckoned to, beckoned to him, and as I said, that word beckon means a signal. In other words, he couldn't just say it out loud, but he beckoned to him that he should ask to whom it would be of whom he spake. Then, it's like there is, even contextually, you see something change. Then, as a result of him beckoning, like, you know, if I'm, if I'm down the table and I say, hey, Peter, ask him, ask him, ask him. As a result of that, it says, he then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So we see that there was a, 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 a transition that took place. John, now I'll just read this because I'm going to read it to you like the Holy Spirit gave, gave it to me. John went from a place of closeness to a place of ultimate closeness. There was no other place to be had. What we see here is when it says that he was lying on his bosom and then it uses a totally different word to express breast is that he went from a place, it, it's demonstrating here, of understanding that he was already close and he was already leaning, but he changed his posture to get even more and to get more information. In the natural, there was no more room for anyone else besides for John's position. But now that Jesus has ascended to the Father, there is room for billions to lean their face against the breast of the Father. Amen. Hallelujah. John went, and, and the only way that I can picture this, if, if, if there's a distinction here like I'm seeing it, and also contextually, is that John went from a place of having his head on his shoulder to getting his head and his face right up against his chest. Hallelujah. Yeah. There's a place for all of us to go in our spiritual posture from close to closest. Let me just read some, of, some more of this. Are you one of the 70? They knew him in power and were obedient, but had the capacity to become offended and leave. And they left, of course, as I said, because of doctrine. Why settle for a life of the pursuit of power when there's something far greater? Listen, folks, you understand this. This is why you're here. We, we love the power. We love the aspects of revival, but there's something far greater, and that is absolute intimacy in him. And out of that intimacy in him comes all the power. It comes all the righteousness. It comes everything that is afforded through that intimacy. Hallelujah. Why settle for something less? Uh, somebody might say, well, I'm a preacher of righteousness. And I'd say, amen. Amen. That is absolutely wonderful. But I'm telling you, there's something that encompasses we have a message of righteousness, but I'm telling you, when you walk into him and you put your face, your spiritual face up against you, you now here's the message where we're going. We're already, we're already in a place, a posture of closeness. He's saying this, we've got to change our posture of closest closeness to the closest possible place that we can get in him. Hallelujah. Do you fall in the category of the 12? You may have your whole life and following him, but still you may have, you may give your whole life and following him, but still wonder what's in it for me. Um, I understand that the, uh, I, and, and, I, and I put this in my notes, I understand that all of them ultimately became John, okay? We understand that. Um, here's another question for all of us. Do we fall in the category of the three 
you may walk in an inner circle with the Lord, but still have the capacity like Peter to misinterpret. You could still misinterpret this, where we're going and what's, what's happening. John made an adjustment in his physical posture. I understand this is physical, but it's speaking something to all of us concerning spiritual things. John made an adjustment in his physical posture. He already... He was already in the bosom of Jesus when he decided to get as close as he possibly could. There was no distance between John's face and the breastplate of Jesus. And when I said uh, beyond bosom uh, concerning the title of this message, that's what we're saying is uh, that John took the posture that I'm going to get, if there's another inch to get, if there's another place of intimacy I'm going to get that. John went from a shoulder bosom to a heart breast position. This picture could be difficult for some men, but it is perf a perfect picture in the spirit for all of us seeking to know him. As a man, uh, somebody said, well, I can't see that putting my, sh my head on another. We're talking about Jesus here. We're, t we're, we're understanding some, a, a, a practical application uh, a spiritual thing that has a practical picture here to it. John, well, as a man, I, it, it'd be hard for me to think laying my head on another man's shoulder and then, then as a result of something more that I wanted, it, it'd be like, what would we say? Snuggling up. Yeah. I mean, really snuggling up. He went from bosom to, to chest plate he got his ear as close as he possibly could to the heart of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say this real quickly with some observations. With his ear up against his chest, he could hear the Lord's heartbeat. Did you hear that? Yeah. Where, 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 is, where is this going? I, I can tell you uh, the practicality of it because some of you may be wondering, okay, what are you saying? I'm saying this. Well, let me read the notes, and then, and then, I'll, then I'll say more. With his ear against his chest, you can hear the Father's heartbeat. Now, it doesn't say this. I'm just giving this as a practical example. Andrew, Thaddeus, Matthew, Nathaniel, they were all at the table, and they could hear his voice, but only John could hear his heartbeat. Only John. John could not only hear his heartbeat, but he could hear his whisper. Hallelujah. In his proximity, his proximity gave him the answer immediately. Intimacy with God promotes answers. It, 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 it speeds up. Having your heart, having your, your face up against the, uh, the Father's bosom Speeds that up. Only love, and I, here's the thing. You know when Jesus said, all of you will forsake me this night? And they did. That There was a moment they scattered. But when you read John's gospel, or when you read the gospel, uh, there was only really one disciple at the cross, John. Somehow love followed him all the way to the cross. Um, I would say these things in observation if someone said, Pastor, I can't hear his voice, maybe you're sitting too far down the table. You're, you're, you're his disciple, and maybe you may be following him, but here's, uh, Pastor, I'm all about business. I want to get this thing done. I want to get her done, and let's, let's, let's go on. You can, you can have a business mentality and still miss the heart of God. Hallelujah. Y'all, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help me, help Glory. me. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. You may be down the table planning a, 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 a citywide crusade and yet still not have his heart. What's it going to take? Now, here's, here's, here's some just suggestion or here's some things that when, I, uh, when he said, what's it going to take? It's going to take a group. A group that says, I will not measure myself by the standards of the majority of the body of Christ. Amen. In other words, I'm not going to say, I'm really, for us to have what we're after, 
we can't judge ourselves by the standards of the rest of the body of Christ. Here's the next thing is, I will not measure myself by my own standards, saying I'm closer to him than I've ever been before. We can't even afford that luxury to say, well, you know what? We're way better than the rest of the body of Christ. And then as it narrows in, as this circle, as this fear comes down to where we're going, I can't even say I can rest here because I'm closer than I've ever been. It's not, that's not good enough. I've got to change continually my spiritual posture to go from close to closest. I've got to go from bosom to, to, to the very heartbeat of his chest. I've got to position my spiritual ear to the place where I'm continually making a squeeze on him. Hallelujah. And that word meant to, uh, to, 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 to violently or to really squeeze him. John, I'm not saying he was demonstrative. I just see as you look at this that John went very silently from one place to the next physically, but it speaks volumes to me of the necessity that he took in hearing the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. Just the whisper. I don't think all the rest of the disciples really heard what Jesus said to John at that moment in time. We must take another squeeze on him. Everybody say with me, let's take another squeeze on Jesus. Amen. What are some of the, uh, the, the academics to, to doing that? Um, I'm glad you asked. So just in a few more minutes that I have, let's turn to, to Revelation. The book of Revelation. This is familiar to many of you. But I want us to look at worship. And I want us to say just, I want to say a few moments, some things about the intimacy of private worship and how that uh, private worship and worshiping him, not just corporately, what did the Holy Spirit say tonight? The Holy Spirit was addressing even before we began to saying something like this, and I can't repeat it, this will all, it it's all on tape, it's all on, it's recorded, but the Holy Spirit was saying, he was answering the heart, and the heart of the jest of you, and many watching was, I want this, I, I want this atmosphere, I want what Dayton is, de is, is, is demonstrating and what I'm feeling. And the Lord is, was saying to us graciously, you, you can have this and you don't have to be in Dayton. You don't have to be here all the time. But the Lord was saying this atmosphere and this what I'm giving you, this is for you all the time, any place where you're at on planet Earth. Amen. Hallelujah. And one of... It, it, you know, it's wonderful that, you know, I've tried to take you through the stations of narrowing this down and saying, you know, there, that there was 70, then there was 12, and then there was three, and then there was one that really had his heart beat. That's wonderful. That's a good illustration. But if I leave you there, we've not really taken any steps. How do we, how do we, uh, how do you and I deliberately uh, take those intimate steps? To, to continually put our face, my, I, I want to put Bronk Flint's spiritual face up against the Father on a continual basis, up against the, the breastplate of Jesus on a continual basis, so that everything he is, that it's not, I'm, I'm not doing business for him, I'm, 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 I'm moving with him yeah. with his heart yeah. through intimacy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we, we've continued to hear through the years this message on worship, and, and we've, we've taught it. Pastor Jim's taught it. He's done series on, on private worship and, and, and intimacy, tremendous, some, some, some tremendous teachings. But let's just look at it real quickly as we're getting close to an hour here. We're going to be closing here in a little bit. But this is John looking into heaven, and this is heavenly worship, but it speaks to us as earthly worship. And, and, and how that this place of intimacy is, can be carried out. John said this, he saw this. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as, as it were a trumpet talking with me and said, come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne and he that sat 
was to look upon like a jasper and a sardis stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seat, or twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass and to the, uh, like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now these angels are incredible looking. I mean, they're just, it's amazing what uh, John saw and is describing. And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast was, had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not, look at this, they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Hallelujah. So we see this angelic and saintly, these four and twenty, these 24 elders, and we see what we see here is we see the worship of heaven, and we see that what happens here is something that is incredibly uh, contagious. It's like an inertia uh, that takes place. When you describe, and, and as I have tried through the years to describe um, worship and private worship, and we've had corporate worship, wonderful this week, and the, what the Holy Spirit has said to us tonight as he began this service, you, you can go on past this. And what he was saying, it didn't matter if it was numbers. He was actually describing a place of private worship that we could, that we could have. And what we see here is that these, these angels, as they begin... You see, you would think, you'd actually think in your natural mind that anything as redundant as saying something over and over again uh, would, just, would just be the most boredom thing possible. But what we see here is this, is that when these angels, if you want to call them that, these beasts, I would call them angels, when they begin to worship, the contagiousness of that transfers over. It's like there's this continual worship service, and these 24 elders, they arise, they throw their thrones at the, they, they cast their crowns at the throne, and they begin to out of their own volition to worship God and to praise God. It's like as they begin to worship God that there's this cascade of his glory that comes and it renews each time so that nothing is old. It's always renewed again and again. And there's, the redundance is not mechanical. The redundance is the, is the glory of the Lord. And it's so contagious that all they want to do is they want more and more and more and just one just one thou art worthy solicits from the rest of them i've got to have this and they again go into this place of continual worship that it's it's just it's just so strong they can't resist it they can't resist i had a friend that was years ago a really smart guy and he, he he's written several books and um but he he doesn't do this now he did this as, as a younger man he was into falconry and he would tell me I was amazed. I, I didn't know him then as, as, a, as in, in that sport of, of using falcons. And uh, he actually went out west and he climbed a mountain with another guy. And they actually, I don't know, it probably wasn't legal. They ca I don't know. <laughs> they captured this small, small chick. They climbed up a mountain and, I mean, just really climbed up there and got, and he raised this falcon. And you know, a falcon is a bird of prey. And of course, uh, Falconry is it's a it's a it's an art, and uh, you actually can teach these falcons like eagles to um, uh, as birds of prey. And and he would use it. 
I mean, he wasn't a duck hunter, but that's, you, you can hunt ducks with these, with these falcons. Sorry, duck lovers. But um, uh, he would go and he would, he would take, um, and, he, and he would tell me, and it was a pretty amazing that he would go to these places and he, he would go to these uh, ponds or whatever and, 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 and he would set his falcon, you know, he'd set his falcon up into, he would take off and the falcon would get up there and he would be soaring and um, he would be circling the pond and then he would scare the ducks out and the, the, the falcon would, you know, descend. But he said what would happen was he would watch and he said that he would watch this falcon as he began to circle, and he would watch him as he would catch, and, and I didn't I'd understand this, but he explained it to me. He said, there are thermals that the, the falcon is, is waiting to catch. And he said, when he, these thermals are coming up out of the earth, out of the ground, and when he catches these thermals, he's, he, he just, without even hardly flapping his wings, it'll shoot him up, you know, several more, maybe thousand feet. So he's ascended up there, and so he's, he's circling around, going around and around, and when he catches these these heat waves, these thermals that are coming up from the earth, it'll just shoot him up and he doesn't have to really even flap much. He's just up there because the thermal shot him around, brought him up to a higher ascendancy. And so he explained all that and then he explained how that all happened. When you go into God, what we see here is this. These four and 20 elders and these beasts, these angels, they were in that sense catching the thermals of God. They were catching, uh, listen, I, I wish that, and we're running out of time, but I'll tell you this, one of the keys, one of the major keys for you and I, we can't divorce ourselves from this, is a place of private worship, getting into God to the place that we survive boredom, that we go past the place where it seems like saying, the, this is a good script. This is a good script. If you don't know how to go into private worship, this would be some good things to say. I love you. You're holy. You're wonderful. But I can tell you this, if it works in heaven, it'll work down here. Yes. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You will inevitably hit thermals where you go into places and it will, it will take you into places in God where that everything that he is becomes everything uh, the the appreciation and the intimacy and we cannot have this revival or this outpouring without putting our face against his breast and these it's it's like it's like these angels they're there in that place and they're worshiping him and they can't get enough and it's like it seems like it resides or, or or wanes just for a moment and it's like somebody mentions it like holy and somebody goes uh, worship? Did somebody say worship? Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. And they just do it count endlessly, age after age after age. And it's so contagious. And it will be contagious in your life. It'll be contagious in my life if we carry it past this place and say, Lord, I know, I know maybe you're pleased with me. I, I feel your pleasure. But for us for to go to the next place close must go to closest. It must go to a place where the where we're all we may be snuggled, but we've got to snuggle tighter than we've ever been. And part of that, and a great big part of that, is your place of of, of private worship and a place of getting. Listen, I, I'm all about business, but I'm telling you. You remember what Dave used to say? Uh, those of you that know uh, Pastor Dave, some of the some of uh, a, a lot of what we heard uh, towards everything that he was saying and when we were hearing him a lot was the message of love yeah. and he says the love is the uh, is really that great last revelation that's going to catapult us and he hooked that up with worship and he said that intimacy combined with everything else we know with the word and with praying in tongues is going to catapult us into a place where we're going to receive this great outpouring. I would encourage you. I would encourage you. Go from close to closest. Go beyond bosom. Bosom's wonderful. That's a place of intimacy. Go to the place where bosom goes to a place where you snuggle so close that you can hear his heartbeat. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you get anything? I hope so. Praise God. Pastor Jim. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Please stand.
You know, uh, you can go to, like, mechanic school to work on cars if you want to. And, um, you know, they can show you all the tools, but if they don't teach you how to use them, then all you have is a bunch of tools. You know, it's like that commercial where the, like, those two kids that have a flat tire. And <laughs> he's like, is this a tire iron? You know, I said, well, it might be. I don't know. <laughs> We're not only uh, having the tools presented to us, but we're being told, here's how you use them. Yeah. You know, here's a tire iron. Here's how you use it. Here's a screwdriver. Here's how you use it. Here's worship. Here's what you do with it. We're learning. Praise God. Amen. Father, I thank you so much. You're leaving no stone unturned in these services. I thank you for the way that you're working. And, your Father, you're, you're painting a masterpiece during this conference. And we thank you for that. And as we leave tonight, just ask you to please watch over us and our vehicles and may we have safety all the way home and back again tomorrow and just wonderful, blessed, peace-filled sleep tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. See you guys tomorrow.